Well, it's a pleasure to be back with you this Saturday evening, October 1st, 2005. And this is Harry Brown with the Saturday Evening Libertarian Conversation. And it's hard to believe it's October already. Where did the year go? He was, uh, he's gotten through nine months and not another war has started. Well, but a lot of things have been going on. It's, uh, it's quite interesting what's happening with the Republican Party. It seems to be breaking into two factions. I mentioned last week that Tom DeLay, that House Speaker who's now under indictment, said that he believed the Republicans in 11 years of government had cut all the fat out of uh, the federal government budget. Uh, that's amazing, since the federal government has grown and grown and grown during those 11 years. But he thinks that uh, they've made a great deal of progress in slowing down the growth of government or even stopping it. But as a matter of fact, the Republican leadership is having a lot of trouble now with a few mavericks in the party who refuse to shut up and agree that the budget is really under control. And one of them is Mike Pence, who is sort of the leader of the rebels. Meanwhile, on the other side, the Republican leaders are Speaker Dennis Pastor, Majority Leader Tom DeLay, or former Majority Leader, Wade the Main Chairman Bill Thomas, and Transportation Chairman Don Young, all the people who are responsible for putting all this fat in the budget. And uh, as we look at what the Republicans have done during this period, we see that federal spending has increased by 79% during the last 11 years. Now, on a cut that down to an annual average, and it's greater than what the Democrats were doing. And, of course, during that period, inflation has amounted to only 28% since the Republicans took control of the House of Representatives in 1995. So, obviously, they can't blame it on inflation. Uh, one of the most obscene things that the Republicans have done is to shove a $286 billion highway bill down our throats, which contains just an unbelievable amount of force. There were more than 6,000 different pet projects that will cost American taxpayers over $24 billion. By pet project, I mean projects that have no redeeming value for the economy, for the country as a whole, but were put there purely to satisfy one congressman or another. And, of course, one of the most infamous of these was the famous Bridge to Nowhere in Alaska. This Alaskan bridge goes, crosses over an inlet to an island, which contains about 50 people living on it. And those 50 people, of course, have a ferry to get back and forth to the mainland. But you and I are going to spend 203, pardon me, $223 million. And Don Young, the House Transportation Chairman, uh, sponsored this bill to put $223 million into a bridge that's going to service these 50 people over on the island. In fact, over a billion dollars of this highway bill is earmarked for Alaska. And apparently, after the bill was passed, Young actually bragged that the bill was stuffed like a turkey with pet projects. Now, we know that disaster relief for Hurricane Katrina is supposed to top $200 billion by the time it's done. That doesn't even include the cost of Hurricane Rita. And if you spread out the cost equally to every man, woman, and child in America, the average family of four is going to spend $3,000 on Hurricane Katrina. You have $3,000 to send to New Orleans. And, of course, already various congressmen, not just in Louisiana and Mississippi and Alabama, but in other states, not just in the South, but around the country, are already proposing a bunch of pork projects uh, to be included in the Katrina relief bill. This is not unusual. Just pass a bill and you say, uh, a bill to help the poor folks in Mississippi, Alabama, and Louisiana cope with Hurricane Katrina after effects, and you can put anything you want in it. It can contain a federal building in North Dakota, or a new bridge in Montana, or a new library in San Dimas, California. It doesn't matter as long as the bill has what we think is a worthwhile name on it. And of course, no bill is worthwhile if it's going to be sent by the federal government. So what are the Republicans doing about this? Well, obviously, some word of all of this is going to get out, that the Republicans are really just wasting our money. And so the Republicans have decided to start a PR campaign. They've begun a media blitz, and they've scheduled appearances on conservative radio talk shows, uh, you know, Sean Hannity, Tony Snow, Mike Gallagher, Mike Gallagher, most of others around the country. And the purpose of these appearances is to tell you what Tom DeLay told you, that everything is just fine and spending is under control. And Tom DeLay started all this just last Monday when he told the Washington Times, our positioning on this issue as a party that is strongly identified with the American people as sensible and determined protectors of the hardworking taxpayers, demands a unified and clear opposition to those whose policies and agendas are hostile to the taxpayers' best interests. In other words, hostile 
to the Capitol of Democrats who are intent on raising taxes, free spending special interest groups, intent on stirring the ills of society by advocating federal dollars as the only solution, and a bevy of bureaucrats more interested in an expansion of federal programs than in the reduction of ineffective ones. Now, there are conservatives who are fighting back on this, I'm happy to say. And I don't want you to get the wrong idea that just because some conservatives are fighting back on this and speaking up against this doesn't mean that these people are your friends on all issues, but at least they're doing something. David Keene of the American Conservative Union said, what Mr. DeLay does not get is that it is precisely that identification that is in danger, not from Congress intent, but from the actions of the GOP in office. Republicans around the country, grassroots Republicans, are beginning to question the wisdom of devoting their time, their treasure, and their votes to a party that doesn't take its commitment seriously. And uh, that's the end of the quote. While we're on the subject of statements DeLay has made on the subject of runaway federal spending, let's not forget that DeLay actually said last week that there was no more fat in the federal budget. Or to put it in his own words, yes, after 11 years of Republican majority, we've pared it down pretty good. I would be particularly interested if you had some reason to vote Republican after all this, if you could give me a good reason for voting Republican next year in the midterm election or 2008 in the presidential election. Also, if you uh, don't want to call, you can email me. The email address is question at harrybrown.org. Question at harrybrown.org or call me at 1-800-259-9231. It's interesting that a few members of Congress have actually offered to forego the pork that they had in the $286 billion highway bill. Uh, Congressman Pence, Mike Pence, has offered to at least delay the $26 billion of pork that he stuck into the $286 billion uh, highway bill. I'm just looking here in this news release from Center for Individual Freedom that put out a lot of this information, and I, don't, I can't see where Congressman Mike Pence is from. I don't know what state or district. Congressman Jeb Hensarlin of Texas also offered uh, to delay the $16 million that was earmarked for highway construction in his district. And even Nancy Pelosi of California, who's the House minority, the Democrat leader in the House, offered to defer $70 billion of highway pork that was earmarked for her district. But we do not want to overlook the word defer, delay. They should be canceling. They should be getting rid of it. Needless to say, the federal government has no authority in the Constitution to be building any highway. You know, I haven't talked about highway construction in a long time. Most people think there would be no interstate highway if it weren't for the federal highway bill. That's wrong. The interstate highway system, as we supposedly know it, began during the Eisenhower years in the 1950s. But the fact of the matter is that there were transcontinental highways long before that. Have you ever heard of Route 66? There was a song about it in the late 40s. Get your kicks on Route 66. Uh, and it named a bunch of the cities that it passed through across the country, including uh, such, I uh, can't really remember the cities, but such faraway states as North Carolina and Arizona. In other words, Highway 40, uh, Highway 6, 6, Highway 66, covered the entire country. On the other hand, now that we have the federal government paying for these highways, we have Highway, uh, what is the name of it? Scott, I wish I could think of it. I used to live in the Bay Area of uh, California. That's around San Francisco. There's a highway there. I think it begins with an 80-something that goes from Oakland down the the coast, uh, like 50 miles at the most, into the San Jose area. And it does not cross any state line whatsoever, but it's a U.S. highway. So the U.S. government is paying for highways that are supposedly interstate highways that never cross the state line, that are just within the state. Why wouldn't the state of California pay for this in its entirety? if it thinks that it's so important to have this highway. Well, I have no idea. No more idea than you. In the old days, highways did not begin and then just stop at the state line because there was no federal government to plan. The states got together and made joint plans and joint efforts, and highways crossed California, Arizona, Mexico, Texas, to Oklahoma, on across the country, even though the federal government was not involved in any way whatsoever. And, of course, the highways are cheaper to build than they are, cheaper by probably 25% of these. Estimates by experts have said that keeping the federal government out of it to begin with means a reduction of 13% cost. But that's just the beginning of it. Because when you bring the federal government in, what you get is not only a much more expensive 
cost to build the highway, but you get a whole lot of things thrown into the highway bill that have nothing to do with the highway bill and just simply add to the cost. For example, the people move in Detroit, which has never worked anybody's satisfaction. The subway in Florida. Imagine the subway in Florida. The big dig in Boston. Oh, my God. That thing is tens of billions of dollars over budget and years behind schedule. It's still, even after it's done, has to be repaired, has to be modified, because it just didn't turn out the way it was promised. And so you get all these extraneous costs piled on that have nothing to do with building projects. So, of course, the point is that we shouldn't defer these $286 billion worth of port projects. We should end them, get rid of them entirely. Take it. That's it. Now, I will put on the radio link page, the Center for Individual Freedom, which was kind enough to provide this information about uh, what was going on with the Republican Party fat in the budget and also its desire to uh, carry on the PR campaign that they're really cutting the budget. Uh, we also should note that the president has power to be thin funds that have been authorized by Congress. In other words, just because Congress authorizes the money doesn't mean the president has to spend it. And the uh, Center for Individual Freedom points out that previous presidents had used this to trim spending, that they just cut spending out of the budget passed by Congress. And I'll give you some examples of that when we come back. But uh, I'd like to hear from you. I really want to know, I want to hear from somebody who still thinks it's worthwhile to vote Republican. I want to know why. Uh, Alex Jones had called in a couple of weeks ago and, and uh, pointed out that on his website he had published a... Uh, a cartoon that somebody had drawn of Bush flying over New Orleans and, and New Orleans uh, knee-deep underwater, and Bush thinking to himself, I wonder if there's some way we can get Halliburton a no-bid contract. And then about three days later, the news came out that Halliburton had been awarded a bunch of no-bid contracts on New Orleans, just like they had been awarded no-bid contracts on uh, rebuilding Iraq. And uh, uh, anyway, the point is that that's, that's the purpose of government, is to reward your friends and punish your enemies and to try to perpetuate your power so you can keep rewarding your friends and punishing your enemies. And George Bush is doing that. And we see how out of touch with reality the statements of the Republicans are making. Now, I'm not saying the Republicans are out of touch with reality. Surely they know what's going on. They are not living in a fantasy world themselves. They just want you to live in that fantasy world. Uh, I, I refuse to believe that Tom DeLay believes a single word of what he said. He just looked at those words and says, I think I can say these words. I think people will believe it. I think I can get away with it. And I think that we can probably keep the Republicans in power for another two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve, fourteen years, who knows how long. So I'll just keep beating this out there, and people don't pay that much attention, so they'll probably believe it. They don't pay that much attention to the news, to the truth, to the figures, to the statistics, to any of these things. And the only people, the only people who could get the press time, the media time, the television time, to call them on this and say, hey, you're a bald-faced liar. You know as well as I do. The spending has increased 79% since you guys took over Congress, so quit telling us you've scared all the fat out of government. The only people who can say that and really get the attention so that you or I and other people would tune in our television on the evening news and hear this being said, the only people who can do that are who? Yes, the Democrats. Yes, yes Joe Biden or uh, uh, who else? Uh, Nancy Pelosi or... Or uh, Edward Kennedy, or Patrick Leahy, or uh, any of these people who stand up and say these things, they could probably get on television and say it. Uh, they come on the Saturday broadcast after George Bush gives his uh, <laughs> it's out of touch with reality view of the news here, there, and everywhere, and they give the Democrats response. But what's the Democrats response? The Republicans have fared too much out of the budget. They're slashing programs for the poor. They are uh, not giving us what we need is an infrastructure around the country. We need more money for education. When are we going to get a health care bill? So naturally, it tends to be reinforced in the idea that the Republicans really are cutting the budget. It's a game they play. I've said this so often. They love the game. They both have a vested interest in making you believe that the Republicans are cutting the budget. Now, let's transfer our attention to Iraq. We have the same situation here. George Bush tells us that we're winning the war in Iraq that the Iraqi security forces are taking over. They're doing a splendid job. In his radio address today, he said that it's reached the point now where U.S. forces, when they take a city, don't have to stay and control that city and occupy it 
to hold it down and thereby tie up their forces, they can now turn the city over to the Iraqi security forces. And if they do that, then they're free to go take another city. Wow. Isn't that wonderful? Could we believe it? I don't think I would. Uh, I don't believe anything they say, so why should I believe that? I don't believe anything they say, unless they prove it to me with some kind of evidence, and they have yet to do that about anything that I can remember. So I used to believe anything George Bush says. Remember, this is the guy who said they had mobile laboratories making chemical and biological weapons, battling the country, spreading the message of hope and death in pre-war Iraq. This is the guy that told us that they had unmanned airplanes that could reach the east coast of the United States and drop chemical and biological weapons on us. Yeah, yeah, that's the guy. He's the guy that says they had weapons of mass destruction. He and Dick Cheney and uh, who's that other fellow, Don Rumsfeld, all these guys, they said, you know, if they have reconstituted their weapons program, their weapons of mass destruction program, and we know that they have, then we need to go in there disarm disarm it. But why? How are you going to disarm a country that is not armed? And they knew they were not armed. They knew that they had no evidence that Iraq had weapons of mass destruction. Because if they'd known if they, had, if, if they had evidence, they would have presented it. They did. They presented a bunch of bogus stuff to the United Nations, full and towel carrying their water. Presented this bogus information to the United Nations about intercepted calls in Arabic, uh, which they talked about hiding things. They didn't even say they were hiding WMDs. They just said they were moving things around to fool the inspectors. And, of course, that was taken to mean weapons of mass destruction. And on and on and on. It's, uh, you know, the point is that we are dealing with a government of liars. Not to say that governments in other countries are not liars, but we do know for a fact that what we have is a government of liars that I think puts Bill Clinton to shame in the lying category. Let us go to the phone now, and we'll start with Bill in Oregon. Good evening, Bill. Hello. Hello. I, when you were talking about New Orleans there, uh, it reminded me, uh, you know, all the criticism that people are heaping, <laughs> heaping on FEMA. Uh, what's interesting about that is it's so easy to get caught up in the trap of criticizing FEMA which draws attention away from the idea that there shouldn't even be a FEMA or a government disaster assistance at all. I don't believe that's in the Constitution, is it? No, of course not. And uh, it, it's really interesting that people don't stop, at least it seems that people do not stop and think, that why should the people of North Dakota, New Hampshire, and Oregon, and uh, New Mexico, and other states pay for uh, the rebuilding of New Orleans? And then next year, the people in New Orleans are going to have to pay for the rebuilding in Florida. And then the year after that, the people in Florida are going to have to pay for uh, the rebuilding in California after an earthquake, and, you know, it's just a round robin thing. And every time you pass this thing around the country, uh, like passing a potato from one person to another, you add a great deal of cost that wouldn't be there if the locals spent their own money and decided what was really worthwhile spending on rather than what was politically visible and politically profitable. And so uh, it, it just makes no sense whatsoever to have this done on a federal level. Even, even, if it, even if it were constitutional, which, as you pointed out, it definitely is not. I was listening to a program called Now with David Boncaccio on state-run television. What, what, and, uh, what was the one word that you said? Now, N-O-W. Oh, Now, yeah. And uh, sometimes they have good stuff on there, especially when they talk about Iraq. But uh, one night they had a deal on New Orleans, and one of his guests pointed out how Walmart really came through, and they delivered water, and they did all kinds of stuff to help people. And he criticized that. He says, you mean you want to leave rescue efforts to a chain store? Everybody sort of smirked. It was very, very offensive when that happened because the guy was documenting success, and yet he criticized it. Yeah, of course. Uh, you know, and these people uh, pride themselves on being pragmatic on what works. And if Walmart works, why, why in the world would you want to get in its way? Uh, that really was interesting that in Tallahassee there, the Walmart store was, open, store was open. They were selling water. They were selling generators. Uh, no, what you might call pipe gouging if you don't understand economics. And uh, I think it was $300 for a generator. And the local FEMA people were at a loss. They had nothing to offer anybody, but Walmart had anticipated this, so they loaded up their trains and their trucks with the kinds of things that people would need under such circumstances and got them into the local stores there. Uh, it's just a, a typical way that the free market responds to these things. And as I said before, the free market does it quietly, without fanfare, without uh, whining, without complaining, without proposing, without anything. 
it's just there. They may advertise it in the newspaper to tell you what the bargains are, but uh, it's so different from the political process where everybody's yelling and screaming and saying, no, no, my, my project is much more important than your project, and we need the money here. Oh, God, yes, oh, we're going to die if we don't get it, so forth and so on. The free market works really almost invisibly sometimes in the background, and it's just there. As far as I know, we got along fine without FEMA up until 1979, wasn't it? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure, but it's, uh, it probably would be in that era sometime between the late 60s and, and the end of the 70s. That was an era when many, many, many new federal agencies started that we now tend to believe have been there forever. Yeah, yeah exactly. And, uh, uh, and thank we got, you. got along just fine without them. Thank you, Bill. I appreciate the call. And uh, uh, we have time before the break, I think, to see what's going on in Texas with Joanna. Good evening, Joanna. Uh-huh. Yeah. Hi. Thanks for taking my call. Sure. What's up tonight? Well, I've been listening to you for about 15 minutes, and it's true that people in America need to realize that all these things are going on. It's just a political game. People need to realize that Democratic, Republican, uh, hate crime laws that they're trying to pass now, they just turn everything around to deceive people so the attention is taken away from the truth. And so people turn away from the truth and accept the lies. And that's what we've got to understand. And it's very sad because people around the world to understand more of what's going on in the United States than people here in America themselves. So... That's the main issue that's on my mind right now is the hate crime law because it's so serious, and this needs to be um, discussed, this needs to be exposed, it needs to be read. People need to go to the website and find this uh, legislation that's in the midst of um, the cost of maybe being passed, and I hope and pray that we all can do something to stop this. You said uh, that the politicians say all these things to keep our attention away from the truth. And I just wondered if there was a particular truth that you were concerned about or just uh, truth in general. Well, <coughs> it's both. <coughs> In particular, uh, are you aware of the hate crime bill yourself? Yes. Okay, well, <clears throat> first of all, um, as you know, that they're introducing the hate crime bill inside the Children's Safety Act, which has nothing to do with children's safety whatsoever. <clears throat> and that's the first thing <clears throat> that the senators need to understand. All right, uh, uh, please let me interrupt you just a second. Are you talking about a federal bill now, or are you talking about the one in Texas that's being considered? Oh, it's a federal bill. Okay. No, I didn't know about I didn't realize it was a new federal bill. Yes. Um, let me read this something short to you. It says, In a surprising move, the House of Representatives on September 14, 2005, approved the Local Law Enforcement Hate Crime Prevention Act of 2005, which is called H.R. 2662, as an amendment to the Children's Safety Act, which is H.R. 3132. It was approved 223 to 199. And also, it says, the Senate is expected, expected to also approve a similar amendment within a month. So, um, this is, they're going to be voting on this again, and this is very serious because it says, for instance, it enforces nationwide the working ADL definition of hate as being biased against federally protected groups such as homosexuals, but automatically makes the Bible into hate literature and preaching from it into hate speech. And so the result, Bible-believing Christians become potential hate criminals. And it's also going to take away all free speech and free radio. Well, of course, it'll be enforced selectively like every other law is. And uh, certainly at the outset, there will not be any egregious prosecutions. But, uh, you know, it's there on the book, and it can just creep along there and become progressively more insidious as time goes by. And, of course, there is, there is no warrant in the Constitution to even, for the federal government to even prosecute murder or rape or robbery or any of these things. There is no authority in the Constitution for the federal government to be involved in any of those things. It can't give money to police departments. It can't pass uh, uh, carjacking laws. It can't do any of those things under the Constitution because that's not the province of the federal government. It's the province of state and local government, according to the Tenth Amendment. And one last word about the hate crime. Uh, there should be no such thing as hate crimes. Even if it were constitutional, even if it were done only at the state or local level, it still makes no sense. It doesn't matter what someone's motive is. What is important is what someone does. You should be prosecuted whenever you do violence against somebody else. And it doesn't matter if you have the best of motives. You still should be prosecuted and find out what those motives are then and find out if there are extenuating circumstances such as you were defending yourself. But, of course, such motives as God told me, or something of that sort, did not hold up in court. But if you do not do violence to somebody, you should not be prosecuted, no matter what your feelings are. And if you do violence, you should be prosecuted in the same way as anyone else who does violence. Whether you have hate in your heart, or liquor on your breath, or drugs in your system, it really doesn't matter. What's important is what you do, not what you have in your body, not what you have in your mind, because once you go down that road, you are in big trouble in trying to sort out who should be prosecuted and who should Something that was on the news was the fires in California. They come every year, fresh fires, uh, forest fires. And it really is interesting how the comparison is never drawn between government lands and private lands. 
When was the last time you heard of a forest fire on private property? And there are some huge forests on private property. Boise Cascade, for instance, has enormous in the Blue Mountains of Oregon. And there are similar private forests all over the country. Never hear about such fires. You also never hear about all the pollution in the forest that happens in government forests. Uh, I think wherever direct comparisons are possible, private ownership equals clean, while government ownership equals polluted, degraded, and dangerous. For example, there are government-owned forests in the Blue Mountains of, of uh, Oregon that have suffered permanent damage. Nearly all the seed-bearing pines have been destroyed, and the entire forest have been devastated by them. But next to one of the big forests is a Boise Cascade that has suffered practically no insect damage. And Boise uses logging practices to keep the forest expanding, protecting its investment. It has to protect its investment. The day that the future possibility of logging dies out because they have done something wrong is the day the dividends stop, and the day the dividends stop is the day that the stock uh, plummets, and the day the stock plummets is the day that the managers of the company uh, find all their stock options to be worthless. So they have a vested interest in making sure that the forest is planted, something that government managers don't have. As a result, the Boise forest looks very much like a bit of history there. The same comparisons exist when you uh, look at properties that are used for mining or grazing. Private owners take special care of their own land to preserve their value for eventual detail. But when private companies lease government property, property they don't own, the personal incentive to protect the value of the property is gone. Neither the companies nor the government managers have any incentive to make sure the property is protected. The government even loses money on many of these leases, which are usually granted to you get this politically influential companies, and they're done on three hard things. The most effective way to reduce pollution, the most effective way to reduce forest fires, is to have the government sell its property to private companies who will safeguard their future value. Uh, you know, we were talking earlier about uh, the politicians can say whatever they want because nobody can actually be heard uh, in any wide platform, any wide megaphone, any loud megaphone. Nobody can actually be heard far and wide is going to speak out against them and point out the obvious. The obvious lies in what they're saying. Well, the same thing is true about Iraq. George Bush would say, oh, the Iraqis have taken over now. And it's nobody who has an interest in digging out the truth of what's actually happening to those Iraqi security forces. Who is going to get much of an audience here in the United States? The only people who could really be heard would be the Democrats, the Democratic Senate, and a few powerful Democratic Congressmen. But they're not speaking out. They don't want to speak out. Uh, they have a different motive here from on the budget issue, where they really do want to believe the Republicans are heartless budget cutters. But with Iraq, their motive is a little different, and that is not to the vote. They don't want to get out in front of public speech. My God, if, you know, <laughs> if you would be willing to speak out, and of course they aren't, but if you would be willing to speak out to save a few hundred million dollars or even a few billion dollars, then why wouldn't you be willing to speak out to save a few hundred lives or a few thousand lives? My God, George Bush by continuing this first brutal war, has condemned thousands, thousands and thousands of innocent people to death. I'm talking about people in Iraq who have nothing to do with Saddam Hussein, who are simply civilians, who are being bombed, who are being scraped with uh, planes, who are being killed with missiles, who are being killed when American and British troops overrun a city like Fallujah, and many, many other cities that we hear very little about. Uh, every single day, Iraqis are dying along with American soldiers. Why would we uh, want those Iraqi people to die? Why would we allow them to die, let alone allowing Americans to die, when it is all for us? We know the United States government is not going to accomplish what it's about to do. It never accomplishes what it sets out to do anything. So why would we stand by quietly and let George Bush forth allow this war to continue? He could stop it by snapping his fingers. All he has to do is get on the phone and call Congolese advice. Call Donald Rumsfeld. Call the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Call anybody in a position of authority over the forces there and say, enough. That's it. We're going to stop the war. We're going to pull out. We're going to let the Iraqis figure out for themselves what to do with their country. It really is none of our business. And why should we let this happen? What really galls is this man stands there with the Bible in his hands, figures uh, Stands there talking about how he has learned so much from Jesus Christ. You know, the guy who says, Blessed are the people. This is a man who continually invokes his religion, continually lectures us about what's going on in the world. He knows what's going on over there. I don't consider him to be the brightest bulb in the firmament. 
but I know that no, it's got what's going on. And he's letting all this out. It is bloody murder. If Bill Clinton was going to be impeached for having a stain on a blue dress, among others, then why would George Bush be impeached? Killing. And I mean killing. This is a deliberate act of murder. Because he, it is what the prosecutors call he saved in different where you could have stopped somebody from being killed, and you didn't. You just simply let it happen. And in letting it happen, you make yourself a party. But the it's not just a party. It's the party. He is the chief instigator. He is the one that ordered those tanks. He's the one that ordered the 150,000 troops to go in there with guns and start firing. He's the one who has said, so technical, even though they're killing innocents. Yes, George Bush is the man. And this is held the count. And I don't care whether he has hate in his heart or love in his heart for democracy. He has caused people to sit down. And he must stand accountable for it, or every president who follows will be free to do the same thing. And we can't afford that. Not as America. We don't want to live the rest of our lives pinching in fear. Fear of terrorist attacks. Which is exactly what we're going to do. On a website called Strike the Boot, a fellow named Alfred A. Hamvid Jr. wrote uh, an article called Quote, They Hate Us Because of Our Freedom. And of course, I put that in quotes because it's about the policy idea of it. A strike the Boot refers to Henry Davis Thoreau's famous statement that there are a thousand hacking at the branches of evil once with strike at the root. And the website, of course, is Strike the Boot. I'll put this uh, article up on the video link page read the whole article and go to the homepage of Frank Arruda and probably see some other articles in my life. But the reason I, my attention was called to it was because there was one paragraph in the article referring to this state statement for our freedom that I thought was particularly potent. And this is what he said. Oh, are you free to smoke a joint? Are you free to hire someone to help you satisfy a physical birth? You can do both in the same afternoon in Amsterdam. <laughs> I haven't heard of anyone attacking the Dutch because of their freedom. If you are not free to entertain your mind and body in any way that does not harm another with anyone who is willing, you are not free. Those are the words of Alfred A. Hamid Jr. at the website. And it is an important point. Uh, there are other countries in the world that in some ways are much freer than the United States. But we have to realize that freedom is a relative concept in the sense that when you're comparing one country with another, you're going to find that country A has certain freedoms that country B doesn't have. But country B, on the other hand, has certain freedoms that country A doesn't. For example, uh, in this, uh, are you free to smoke a joint? Are you to hire a physical year? Or in the Netherlands, they have uh, a number of individual, um, what we might call gratification freedoms, that are perfectly legal. Whereas those, some of those things are not legal in uh, other countries. But you also don't have some of the freedoms in the Netherlands that you have in football, such as the privacy of a bank account, although you probably have more privacy in the Netherlands than you have in the United States. And it goes around its purpose to a certain extent. So we shouldn't get carried away thinking, oh, oh, uh, the Netherlands must be a much bigger country than the United States. It is in some ways, and it isn't in some other ways. But the point is that I think that there's more to just they hate us for our freedom. They hate us for our religion. They hate us for our bullying. And I think bullying really is the key word. We are the world's only superpower that people never hire a felon. Now, if we just sat back like three times, waiting to be uh, given a good reason to defend ourselves, and somebody was decided that he was going to appoint a stick at this week in time, that would be one thing. But to attack countries like Afghanistan and Iraq, which did not attack the United States, which have not aggressed in any way against us, which in no way poses a threat to the United States, is, of course, to throw our weight around like what we do. And because of that, they hate us even more than they did before. And why did they hate us before? Because we were not free. Well, let us say our government was not free. It was throwing its weight around. At uh, some point, somebody, maybe even me, has to honor all of the interventions that the United States has perpetrated against other countries in the world over the last 50 years. I'm talking about going in and imposing this new deal the Dictatorial Government on the people of the Dominican Republic, and then later imposing the Dictatorial Government 
that the United States government now found him to be here. Uh, doing the same thing in Haiti. Doing the same thing in Haiti. Doing the same thing in Haiti. Uh, doing the same thing in Haiti. Doing the same thing in many places in the Middle East. Changing sides. Uh, going in and disrupting the elected government, like the government of Iran in 1960. Uh, it just goes on and on and on. This is not a sweeping giant. It is a restless bully who can never keep status. And as a result of that, we have produced enemies all over the world. They don't hate us. Though. They hate us precisely for the opposite. We're denying them their freedom. Do what they want. Be the kinds of governments they want to themselves. And to live their lives. They want to live it. Not as the United States decides today that they should live it. And then change it to tomorrow. And tell them they must live it another way. It goes on all over the world. In Indonesia, the United States has caused the death of tens of thousands of Indonesians, of East Timorese, uh, people throughout South Korea. Look how many died in Vietnam as a result of the United States uh, deciding what it wanted in South Vietnam. First it was the DM government, then it arranged the DM's assassination in order to get rid of him to try to do something different when the iron battle was the DM didn't produce the results that they had hoped. Similar situations happen to us. Uh, even in China, yeah, uh, the United States pledged to sell it to Chiang Kai Shek and then abandoned it when the time came, uh, the push came to show. And it, it just goes on and on and on. Not only is the United States holding its way on others, but it makes promises that now it's saying that it will protect leaders of other countries. It will shore up government. And then it just pulls the chair out from under them when the time comes. Uh, that it had to face the price. So, they don't hate us for our freedom. They just want us to leave them alone. All right, let's get back to the real world. And Joanna has something further to say. She talked with us earlier and now is back again. Good, uh, good evening, number two, Joanna. Hello, Mary. This is Hannah. Thanks for taking my call again. I'm sorry, I, I couldn't hear you. Yes, you're good, too. Um, thanks for taking the call again. Um, I was... I wanted to say to you that um, when I heard your response earlier, the Iron Crime Laws, I don't just understand that it's the federal government trying to take over. And just because the Constitution is completely and taking away people's rights, taking away the freedom of, of Americans. It's not just about punishing people who are guilty of, of um, doing that law by violence, you know, through violent acts. It's not that at all. It's um, the federal government trying to take over local law enforcement and um, also trying to end all free speech review. And this has nothing to do with self safety. And that's what they're putting inside the self safety act so people don't realize that if they pass the law being a child for children's safety, they're just going to vote for it, not realizing what's really hidden in there. Yeah. Get people's freedoms and rights away from the Americans. Okay, we're yeah. having a hard time hearing you because uh, of the connection for some reason. But as I get it, um, you're saying that somewhere down the road is this hate crimes legislation is going to be used against top radio. And that's certainly possible. Uh, it, it just seems absurd at this point that that could happen. But all laws seem absurd when they're first passed and somebody says, hey, you know, this is a slippery slope. This could lead to such and such. And people say, oh, no, that's crazy. It couldn't possibly happen. But then it does, and by the time it does, it seems like a logical thing. It no longer seems absurd. It just seems like the obvious uh, next step after whatever it was that came before it. And so we do have to be vigilant about this. And we do have to, to make sure that uh, these people can get their feet to the fire. Now, we can't vote these people out of office. They are, in effect, there for life for as long as they want to be, just like a Supreme Court justice. Uh, the re-election rate on Congressmen is well over 90% and, and steady. And so the only thing we can do is to try to scare them as much as possible, even though they know they can't be deposed, they still can be scared. And that's why I am very much uh, in favor of Downside CC and why I'm uh, associated with Downside CC, because I think it is the one thing going now that really has a chance to make a difference, and that is to set up a large-scale organization that can make it very, very, very easy for people to email their congressman on some particular item. And they have set up a system whereby when they want to fight something, all you have to do is to enter your zip code and there's an email all set up, addressed to your congressman, and all you've got to do is add a final sentence or whatever and uh, just whip it off and your congressman is going to get it. And I think that this is one way we can keep their feet to the fire, even though we can't get rid of it. And one of the most important things that they're doing right now is promoting this Read the Bills Act, this uh, legislation that would require that no congressman can vote on a bill until he has sat in the House chamber and listened to every word of that bill that he's going to vote on. And if the bill is 2,000 pages long, then it's going to be too long and nobody's going to listen to it and they won't be able to vote on it. 
And uh, there's a lot more to it, of course, and a lot of ramifications to it. But it's surprising how much support this is getting. It's getting support from both Republican and Democrats uh, outside of Congress, but it's also getting support from a lot of Republicans and Democrats in Congress, even though right now it's just lip service. They're still trying to get sponsors for the bill, uh, and they're getting more lip service than they are sponsors. But the progress is being made, and I like it. I like what's happening. It's downside DC. Now, that's a uh, uh, small comfort to what you're saying, Joanna, but it does provide a possibility uh, of inroads into these very things that you're talking about that maybe we can head them off before it gets down to talk radio. And we will be back here next Saturday night. Hope we will get bored from the car because we'll have a lot more things to say. But in the meantime, we have a life to live. And while I hope to do what you can to stop the march to tyranny in this country and to keep it more so from most the positive values of liberty and showing how the free market solves our problems and the government never solves those problems. All I want you to take every opportunity to point these out without damaging yourself, without losing your job, without losing your friends. I also want you to be sure to focus on your own life, because that's something you do control. You don't have to wait to see what others do. You can do something this week to make your life better and to enhance the life of everyone in the family. I hope you'll do so, and I hope to talk all of you back next week. And I hope you'll listen to this inspiring music by Alfred and Selby as we close out the show. Let it remind you that while there are tribulations in this world, there are times. Oh, man, are there times. Let us never forget. Never let us ignore the opportunity to make a very good happen.